Welcome to One Million Cups. My name is Milton Jeffrey. I'm one of the organizers, and I've got uh, Courtney Britton. I've got Brian, and Lance is on his way up. These are your other fellow organizers. Um, this morning, again, we just want to welcome you here. Um, do we have any first-time visitors here this morning? Welcome. I see one of our presenters is raising his hand. All right. Uh, any of our One Million Cups veterans here today? Welcome again, glad to see you all here. Uh, for the first timers, just a little bit about One Million Cups. Um, each, it's an entrepreneurship uh, program here at Kaufman. Each week we have two presenters come and tell the story about their journey. They talk for about six minutes, then we open it up to our panelists and to the audience for questions for about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I'd like to also introduce our expert panels, panelists here today. Um, I'm gonna have them stand up and just do a quick introduction about who they are, and also you can see their information on the board up here. Um, my name is Stephanie Zamora, probably seen a lots of you, and you've probably seen my uh, face on the Casey SourceLink information, previously of Casey SourceLink, and also the Innovation Center Business Incubator out in Independence. Uh, currently run my own business, it's an electronic security company, and I'm excited to be here this morning. Hello, I'm Ben Cottrell. I am one of the founders of DoodleKit, which is a do-it-yourself website builder for small businesses. I'm also a tech strategy consultant for a lot of local businesses in Kansas City, and I host a, a podcast called Spare Room Radio, where I interview um, local entrepreneurs. Thanks. Thank you. So let's get started. Our first presenter is Teresa Hamilton of Giving the Basics, which is a nonprofit that provides human dignity products. Welcome. opportunity to be here is really for Kansas City. It's awesome for you to be able to hear what we're doing with giving the basics. I'm going to start off with a video and then I'll take, I'll give you a couple of um, good facts about giving the basics and then we will take questions. So let me get you started here. My name is Linda. I'm a single mother with four children. I work hard, but I struggle every month paying my bills and buying food for my family. I'm on government assistance off and on. I don't want to be, but it's so hard to take care of my family and what little money I can bring in. I've gone to a food pantry, but they never have enough of what I need, especially to keep me and my kids clean. As of our last school year, which would be the 2013-14 school year, we reported to the state that we had 1,520 homeless students that were identified. Approximately 75% of our students live in uh, low-income households. Last year during the 2013-14 school year, we served over 1,200 students. As a school district, identified nearly 500 students in the Shawnee Mission School District, meeting the federal guidelines of homeless. Right now, we have about 10,000, over 10,000 students who are economically disadvantaged. Almost 40% of our students qualify for free and reduced lunches. So these kids need the basics. I'm Teresa Hamilton, founder of Giving the Basics. We are a 501c3 that provides personal care products for human dignity. We got the center school district called and asked us to help them get products for their kids because the nurses and teachers were paying to get them soap, shampoo, and deodorant with their own money. They're taking the clothes off of the kids during the day, washing them, and giving them back to them. Then the Kansas City, Missouri School District called us, and then the Kansas City, Kansas School District called us, and then we got a call from Shawnee Mission, and it's, it's just everyone saying the same thing. These kids can't succeed in the classroom without these products. In Kansas City, Kansas, we get a letter from a, Kansas, a girl was being bullied in the classroom. So they said to the kids, they pulled them all in, they said, why are you being mean to her? She seems like she's a really nice girl. And they said, because she smells so bad, we just want her to go away. So then they pulled the girl in, and they said to the girl, you're getting picked on. You're not telling anybody you're getting picked on. What's going on here? And she said, it's okay if they're mean to me. I know I smell, 
our family doesn't have any money. I just go to school and try to disappear. What have we done? This year, we've been talking a lot about what it takes in order to be able to soar. And I don't know a lot about flight, but I think there are at least two forces at work. There's lift and there's drag. And the teachers are working really hard to learn new instructional strategies that will support students and provide lift. But then there are some things that, that drag on them and prevent them from soaring. And sometimes their circumstances are a big source of drag for them that interfere with their learning when they come to school. And so it's important to um, have what you need at home so that your teeth are brushed and you smell good and you feel fresh and, and you don't feel different than the others and you're ready to learn. I didn't even realize um, in my position that food stamps did not allow these families to purchase. Um, personal hygiene items. I was shocked to learn that. So this is going to be huge for our kids. When we would go to the stores, we would have to use the EBT card to pay for food and all that. And well, I mean, in the same store, we would have to get hygiene products like toothpaste or toilet paper, but we had to buy those cash because the food stamps is like what it says, food stamps, EBT. And that's all that it pays for. So we would have to pay for those items cash. And sometimes we would just have to settle with the food. If you think about, if you didn't have deodorant and soap and other self-care products, how you would feel on a daily basis, what that feels like to not have those things, and how that can impact learning, which is our ultimate goal in a school district. Well, I mean, feeling good gives you a lot of confidence, and with confidence you could learn better, answer questions more, and, you know, probably help others. And when boys and girls feel good about themselves, they are going to do a better job of applying themselves academically to ensure that they are doing better in school. They feel more inclined to interact with the other boys and girls. It's important for just overall well-being and uh, it, it provides, it just provides a better sense of, of, uh, of self. A lot of times those hygiene items we run out of, even at home, just because we do that. Or sometimes we just don't have the money to get that. And when we send our children to the schools without, that, without those uh, things, then they suffer. You know, they can't get their homework done, and they can't uh, listen while they're doing their studies in the classroom. They're being ostracized even in the classroom or out on the play yard. There's only so much that a person can concentrate on at any one time, so much brain power that can operate. And if students are worried and anxious about how they look, how they feel, how they smell, then it, there's not enough energy and brain power and focus left over for learning. I remember one week I didn't, I didn't have a deodorant or anything like that. So for that week it was just really embarrassing. I had to keep my arms down, couldn't answer any questions or whatever. So. Yeah, that was pretty embarrassing. So, I mean, it would help a lot to, you know, just go to the nurse's office and ask, can I have a deodorant? That would be great. So I want those kids to feel confident when they come to school, that they can sit down and not be afraid that people um, or students are going to make fun of them, that they're going to get singled out because of something that's out of their control that they can brush their teeth every morning, that they can wash their hair and um, just feel normal and feel like every other student that's sitting in the classroom, regardless of what's going on outside of the school setting. And when my kids and I look clean and smell good, we all feel good. I don't wanna cry anymore. Thank you for helping us. We've been asked by the school districts to provide soap, shampoo, deodorant, toothpaste, toothbrush, laundry soap, lotion, and then feminine hygiene products only when needed. Uh, we decided we're gonna take this on and we know that it's not okay with giving the basics that these kids don't have what they need and we know that it won't be okay with anybody else either. So we've got a great system to track the need and match the need, and we're hoping that people see that and that they step up and really help us help all these kids in the Kansas City metro area.
Okay, so, oh dear, I'm playing again. Sorry, guys. Okay, so you can see where we're at with the need. This need is all over the country. It's not just in Kansas City. Thankfully, we get to grow this in Kansas City. That's an amazing thing. I, I'd like to ask you, what would you do if you received a phone call, can you help me with toilet paper? Giving the basics was started because a single mom on government assistance had six kids to raise. She was not receiving child support, and she said, can you help me buy toilet paper? And I said, why? And she said, my card got rejected at the counter for toilet paper. I said, what else did it get rejected for? She said, soap, shampoo, deodorant, toothpaste, feminine hygiene products. I asked her, what are you doing with your daughters, your teenage girls? And she, there was a long pause, and she said, sometimes they just have to stay home. I said, really? I said, did you go to a food pantry? And she said, yes. Well, as we would have it, from there I helped her for 10 months to get everything she needed for her family into her house. After that, she got a job. She got back on her feet, and it was a wonderful, wonderful story. I sat in my kitchen, yay God, yay me, woo, look what we did. Well, guess what? There was this looming feeling, there are others, there are more. I ignored that. I thought, I don't really know what that is going on. About a week later, there are others, there are more. I decided, that's really strange. I'm feeling like there's others, there are more. I have a three-time rule in my house. If it comes up three times, I'm going to deal with it start to finish. The third time I decided I need to investigate what's going on. So what I did is I went around and I called a lot of the food pantries and prison reentry programs, battered women's shelters. Everyone said the same thing. We will always purchase food first if with our money. So I thought I need to really concentrate on starting a charity that targets just these products because long after I am dead and gone, Kansas City needs to be able to be sure that these needs are always met because it starts with the basics. How many of you knew that our future leaders are going to school and trying to disappear? They're not socializing. They're not taking selfies with their friends. They don't want to be bullied, so they're standing apart from the rest of the kids, and they've told us we just go to school and try to disappear. Well, when I took this on, I did not know how huge this was going to be to try to figure out how to run a charity get the 501c3, form a board, all of these things were brand new to me, and I've learned a lot of things I probably never would have wanted to know, but I'm so thankful that I do know today for Kansas City's sake. On my LinkedIn, it's very clear. I am one specific goal to meet the needs, the dignity needs of Kansas City. These are human dignity products. So we launched with, in 2011 with six pantries. Giving the basics is a hub, if you can imagine. All of the local pantries log on to our website once a month and tell us what they need. We started with six pantries. We now have 50 pantries that we serve on a monthly basis come down to Giving the Basics and pick up their orders. Not only that, we have the four school districts. We have 28 states that want the program. And I will tell you, just in Kansas City, we have, um, I don't know why that's playing again. Um, just in Kansas City, we've got 19 uh, pantries on the waiting list. We have six school districts that want help. So this need is crucial. We have people that are great at getting people food in Kansas City. If we feed people, they will keep coming back for more food, but with giving the basics, helping them in between, they may feel good about themselves. It may take a month, it may take two months, but over time they will say, I look like everyone else now. If I could get clean and you could not get clean, today if you could not have used our products, would you have come? Now think about if you couldn't have used them for a week. Could you have gotten a job? Could you keep a job? Okay, so this is where I'm at with everyone. Just let me ask you one question. What would you do if you got a call saying, could, could you help me buy toilet paper? I need you to help me buy toilet paper. So I'm gonna open this up for questions now for anyone who has anything that they wanna ask me. Uh, we'd like to start with our panelists first, and then we'll open it up to the audience as well. Uh, first, I'd like you <clears throat> to commend you on um, taking action um, on that need that you felt. Um, I want to also commend you on having a great website. I took a peek last night. I thought that what was very good about your website is that the call to action was very clear, um, and that you found many levels for people to interact with and engage and support the organization. Um, so I really enjoyed uh, the website. Um, the other thing I thought that was great um, was the donation ticker. 
that you have on the front page. But I really encourage you to, because allowing people to see the impact um, is so important, I want to see it on every page. Okay. I want to be constantly reminded of the large impact that you're making and that touches individual people. Um, the other piece of feedback I had for you was, uh, that's an excellent video, uh, but most people do not watch seven minute videos. I watched it because I uh, was coming here today. Um, but I really would have loved to be able to share with my friends on Facebook maybe a two minute video. Um, just with maybe that the girl's story um, where she shares that she, heaven forbid, wanted to disappear. Making them shorter and more shareable, making it easier to share those stories, um, maybe putting a picture with some of those handwritten stories, which honestly were a little bit hard to read. So make sure the, the clear ones, clear handwriting are kind of towards the top. Um, but I really commend you on having a great website, sharing that with folks. Thank you very uh, much. What nonprofits have you partnered with here in Kansas City that helped you maybe get started um, with this mission? Well, at this point, what we're doing is we are serving uh, all the pantries. So we have, um, we've brought all the pantries together for a meeting, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, pulled everyone together for a meeting so that we could say, let's not trip all over each other on this. Um, this need, without a hub, it will always be clunky. So what we're trying to do is strengthen the hub so that everyone can continue to pull from that hub. Um, so really, we're supplying everyone at this point. And so as those organizations maybe are getting donations, are they then turning those basic donations over to you to be that hub? We're hoping that was the goal of the meeting. Um, the school districts, for the first time in, in Kansas City history, we brought all those school districts together to meet for the same reason. They're sharing how they're dispersing it to the kids. We are hearing that the grades are going up, the attitudes are changing, the kids are socializing that are getting our products, so the impact is, is huge. Well, that's really important. One of the things, when I worked at Casey Source Link, we saw that it was when we got the resource partners together that there was magic that happened, so I encourage you to um, continue to gather those folks together that can operate in kind of silos and it can get a little bit lonely. Um, so I encourage you to gather those folks together here in the future as well. Great presentation, thank you. Um, one of the things that I have to do with my business as a, as a software as a service is, is work on the, the whole user acquisition onboarding process through, through a website. And I think that you're in an interesting position as a nonprofit where you have this, this website that's almost like, it's a shopping cart, it's like Amazon. It's, and, and so I would recommend looking into a lot of um, the onboarding user acquisition, there's a whole, there's a whole set of books and blogs and everything out there where you can tweak it just to get, you know, get your percentage up a little bit more, a little bit more of, of conversions. And for instance, just to second what Stephanie said, when I was, I was looking at the website, I saw a picture, a, woman, a, a little girl drew a drawing, said, you, you make me feel pretty. And that was very powerful. And to have, the, I, would, I would have something like that right on the front page. Good idea. Donate now, you know, and that's just one example, but the, the idea of, of making this sort of a, more like, a, like you would treat a startup, a business, and, 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 and the most important part of that is metrics, and, and measuring what your conversion rate, you know, doing A-B testing and stuff like that, which I can, I can send you some links on, but I wanted to ask, what type of metrics are you measuring right now as far as the effectiveness of the program or on your website or just in general? Well, what we are able to do is I can tell you exactly how many toothbrushes we have sent into the city and where they've landed, into which pantry. Because as the pantries log on and tell us exactly what they need and we fill those orders, we know how many toothbrushes they're taking, soap. So our tracking system, that's why the hub is so important, because we can not only track the need. As a matter of fact, the State Department said we've got a better um, system for tracking the need than they do, which is awesome. Um, so it's really great. That's the metric that we're using is to track where the need is. So I can tell you where we need soap more in this city, where we need shampoo. If someone were to have a drive and dump it somewhere, the problem would be I would be saying, oh my gosh, we need the soap on 17th Street, we need the shampoo on 3rd Street. So we're able to track every product and where it's going. And also the, the drives that companies are having, we're able to track where their products are being given. Got a question for you here in the front? Sure. Nice presentation. 
I, I think that um, you are trying to do what Harvesters does for food, perhaps. Is that be close? Uh, they serve as a clearinghouse collecting food from all over the area mm -hmm. and then distributing it to f food pantries. It's a very, very similar model. We have um, our business models are a little bit different. I don't know their tracking, I just know ours, but basically when we went to the, to the pantries and they were saying that they would always purchase food first when they receive donations, I thought, oh my gosh, if we don't target this, this need will get lost again. We have so many people that are feeling ashamed um, and not succeeding because of it. So I thought we need to make it a separate hub, but very much like that. So um, obviously you use the website uh, to to collect donations, but what is the uh, the realm the spectrum of ways that you um, you collect donations, and is this in cash or is it in kind? Because uh, I haven't gone to the website, so I I don't know how you I would get a toothbrush into the mix, for example. And the reason I asked about harvesters is um, I know they they work with uh, corporations that sell this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and look for um, stuff that maybe is not saleable because it's dinged up or, or whatever. And I don't know if that's feasible with uh, the kind of products you distribute, but I encourage you to look into that. Okay, um, to answer your, your question, we have anyone who can connect us to a Procter & Gamble, a Unilever, a Johnson & Johnson. We have not been able to break through to get from the actual manufacturers yet. Companies have drives, schools have drives, churches have drives. Companies that don't have time to have drives, they are really great about just donating money and saying, can you have it there for our people to come down and sort and count? We, they do team builders at our warehouse all the time. They'll send their management teams down. They'll, from all over the country, they'll, send their, they'll have their executives come in and they will sort, count, and case and have their business going on right side by side. So we take, we do drives and we do financial donations. So we purchase an in-kind, you were speaking of in-kind, um, we've had a lot of local companies donate barrels and stickers. And because it, free product is not free, there are administrative costs that we've gotta um, cover. So it's just some people say, I only wanna give to your administrative costs. I wanna do this, I want, you know, we need a truck. Right now we need a truck, we need, um, to have someone who can manage the warehouse. So we have our own needs at Giving the Basics, so we take in kind all the time. Teresa, we got a question here in the middle. Yes, Teresa. Uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if you're getting large donations of, let's say, shampoo and stuff like that, if you call that in, down into like a two weeks version of that so you can get more of these things out to the people on a regular basis, or are you just giving them the product that you receive? What we're doing is when they put, place their order once a month, we're filling their order because they know that they're going to be able to come the next month. And what's really neat is I knew that we would have been successful in building community the day that the pantries would show up and bring some extras and they weren't hoarding anymore. So it was amazing because it took almost three years and two pantries showed up in the same day. One said I have 500 razors, another one said I have 300 toilet paper. And it was great because I thought, we have successfully built community. They're not hoarding anymore. So they get it every month, and we give it every month. Question here. Good morning. Good morning. Congratulations on what you're doing. Thank you very much. So I always think about funding. I've just retired after 32 years in the federal government. Long-term funding. You can't beat the feds. Have you tried them? And can I help you? Yes, you can help me. And we Number have not two. gotten any government grants, no. Okay. It takes a while, but once you're in, you're in. Number two, short term. Procter & Gamble has a major manufacturing facility here in Kansas City, south of 70, off of the 9th Street traffic way, knocking on a door. We've been there. Oh, okay. Um, and, and we did, did they not answer any, the door? They did answer the door. We had a meeting and we wanted laundry soap so bad because we're always short on laundry soap. And the answer was, you'll need to purchase it at retail. So that's okay, but for, for, but for, for now, I think that they're considering it and they're working towards helping us help the people in Kansas City. Um, with, with having so many states that want the program and different cities, 
Our goal is specifically Kansas City. We're really clear. We want to be the example that every other state follows. Right now, we are leading the country for meeting this need. Kansas City is, is leading the human dignity needs, which is amazing. So we're a great example, and, and St. Louis has been in to see what we're doing. Chicago's been in to see what we're doing. Great, come see what Kansas City's doing, because we are succeeding here because of a lot of people. Teresa, we got another question in the middle. So uh, Hills Pet Nutrition is a subsidiary of Colgate, and I can get you connected to, to Hills and to Colgate. You're awesome, thank you so much. Question here in the middle. You've come to One Million Cups to tell us your story. One Million Cups concept can help you with these other states. Because if you get a volunteer with your kind of gumption in each of these states, it could happen for you. I hope that happens. Thank you very much. When I learned to build the website, it was one of those things where I thought, never in my lifetime did I ever want to learn how to build a website, ever. But things happen when you, when you have that desire. So I hope we find those people. Question here, right? I have a couple questions. Um, one, you mentioned the non-traditional donations. Like you said, hey, we also need a truck. I didn't know if maybe one you thought about maybe adding that to the page somewhere for exactly that category, because there might be that business owner that has that old truck that he's just looking at selling that maybe he would donate if he knew there was a need outside of the traditional stuff, so that's one thought. Second thing, you mentioned laundry soap. I went on the page and I saw where you can actually buy cases of soap or cases of razors as opposed to just making a normal monetary donation. I would assume your needs kind of go up and down month to month, what you have a lot of and what you don't. So have you thought about maybe reorganizing that page based on what we need the most of today? So if someone just didn't want to donate 100 bucks but actually wanted to, quote unquote, buy a case of something, they know that your biggest need today is laundry soap and not razors. We can, we can certainly do that. We do have a wish list on the website um, that kind of tells what we're looking for. And so those in-kind donations where people are wanting to donate, we really do encourage that because everyone has a gift. I mean, you know, if you can use your gift to help giving the basics, help strengthen the city and leave something after you're gone, come, please help us. Tell us what you've got, I'd love to see. That's, that's a great idea. Tr Teresa, do you, uh, to your right, before we wrap it up, do you purchase, when people give you money, are you able to purchase products wholesale or do you have to pay retail? We purchase at wholesale, so actually, efficiently, we set this up to be a web-driven vehicle where donations would come in and we would purchase at wholesale. Actually, we get so much more for the dollar than the individual can get, so that really is the most efficient way to donate to us. But efficiency is the enemy of love, really. If you don't plug them in, they don't work. This city needed to feel this need. They needed to see it. They needed to touch it. So we created an incredible classroom that I would encourage you to come down and see our warehouse. It is amazing. We have to ask people to leave when they come down to volunteer in companies. So what we've created is just a place where everyone can be part of giving the basics. So to answer your question, yes, we really, really love what we're doing here for Kansas City. All right. Thank you very much for coming out. Uh, Thank we've you got so much for having me. One more. Uh, we've got a lot of great feedback from the crowd, but we want to end with a patented question. What else can we as a community do for you? Please come and visit us and get your company involved. And honestly, just call me for a meeting. I've got some business cards back there that you can pick up, some flyers. Have a drive. Get, your, get a team together. Have a fundraiser for us. We don't have a fundraiser. That I'm not good at that. I wish I was, um, but I'm not. So... Think about us whenever you're going to have any kind of an event. Ask for people to get involved and then bring them, lead them to the need. You guys are leaders, and meeting a need is different than leading people to the need so that the need can be met. That's what I would leave you with. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I uh, just wanted to remind everybody that on the back of your sheet, we have announcements for... Uh, Great workshops that are coming up this next week. Um, if you haven't been to the one down at the Enterprise Center of Johnson County, I definitely recommend checking it out. I've been to a couple, and they do a really nice job. Um, next up is Swizzle. And Swizzle is a music video playlist that you can stream uh, and collaborate. And to talk to us about that is Nick Zabo. Let's welcome him up.
friends. Hi, everybody. Oh, good, it works. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about Swizzle, and uh, actually I'm gonna talk to you about the product of our latest pivot, which is video cocktail, so we're gonna go a little bit beyond um, the music video. But first, I'm gonna talk to you about me. My name is Nick Zabo, I'm the COO of Swizzle. Um, I've been an entrepreneur for pretty much my entire working life, but more importantly for this conversation, I do parkour. That's actually me, I was really proud of that picture. Um, in case you don't know what parkour is, it's that new urban sport that's having people jumping from rooftop to rooftop and doing crazy flips over stuff and basically just moving through an urban environment in a fun and creative way. I got my start in parkour by, well, the way most people did by watching YouTube videos. Um, I got hooked and saw, you know, a couple of people doing crazy things and then just watched video after video after video and uh, I discovered a couple of things about myself. Um, one, I suffer from what most people my generation and younger than me uh, suffer from, which I call entertainment ADD. As I'm watching these videos, I found myself clicking through the video to just get to the meat. I didn't really care about the story. I wanted just the parts where people were doing the cool stuff. Um, this, uh, it, this basically led me towards compilation videos. A compilation videos are really cool. Thank God people take the time to put these things together, because they are difficult to make, but they're perfect for that ADD. What they are is somebody goes ahead and downloads a bunch of YouTube videos, and they find just the best parts of them, and they put them together and throw up a video that is just these clips, one after another. They are super popular because it's exactly what the younger generations are looking for, because it's just entertainment. But they have some flaws. One, if you see something really cool, like what that guy just did, you tend to want to dig a little bit further. You want to go ahead and see, you know, I want to watch the whole video where that came from. I want to see more of what that guy's done. But you can't. The way that these things are, I mean, they, they feel like they're multiple, you know, parts made up of this, but, but it's really not. It is just one video. There's no clicking and sourcing and, and going through. You have to do a lot more digging, which honestly, we're all lazy and so we don't really do. Um, but, YouTube compilation videos are pretty much the only way to go from clip to clip to clip really easily, and so I just sucked it up and moved on with my life. Fast forward a little bit, about a year and a half ago, my wife got a call. We were, in, uh, we were actually in D.C., it says St. Louis over there, but we were in D.C. My wife gets a call for a job offer in Seoul, South Korea, and uh, we thought that would be really exciting, so I stopped my businesses, we packed our bags, we jumped on a plane, and we've been in Seoul ever since. Um, while I was there, I uh, did a bunch of sightseeing and things, but I actually met a team of people who were creating this cool new product. They called it Swizzle. At the time, Swizzle was a video playlist system that let you put together music videos that you liked and let your friends collaborate with you and add videos to your playlist. Um, it was really neat, it was still in beta, but it was getting traction, the little map was uh, kind of like a heat map of where they were popular. Um, and me being the entrepreneur that I am, I started talking to them and giving them different advice and things that we could do to make the business grow. Eventually these talks just led to me actually joining up with the team. Um, oh, sorry, I clicked it, I'm sorry. <laughs> joined up with the team um, and uh, one of the first things I did when I joined was I uh, started looking at user data that we had. They did some surveys earlier and I found that a lot of people wanted to cut out that first part of the music video where it's just kind of telling a story, it's not actually the music part. Um, and so I went back to those people that said that and I said, okay, if we did this, what else would we do? And we started having conversations and I found that a lot of them had the same desires that I did when I was watching those parkour videos earlier, where they wanted a way to basically put together these clips and watch them, but also expand upon them a little bit. And so we are creating video cocktails. Now these things are gonna be really cool. Basically what we're doing is we're allowing you to take a clip from any YouTube video that you want, put it together with other clips, and it'll play seamlessly, clip to clip to clip to clip, except each video clip is actually playing from its original source. And so this will let you do cool things like stop the cocktail from playing and watch the entire video where that came from, put it back, continue watching, you can shuffle it around, you can add things to it, you can interact with it on a, you know, basically do what you want to do with them. The other thing too is there's no downloading videos, there's no complicated software, it's really easy, you can do it on your phone. We're really excited about it. 
We're planning on releasing the MVP in May. Uh, the first people that we're gonna be targeting is content creators, people who are making videos, as well as uh, MCNs, multi-channel networks. These are big conglomerates that have a bunch of YouTubers inside of them. Um, we're gonna give it to them as a tool at first to get people to look back at their old content, because that's currently an issue. Um, and also do cross collaboration with other content creators. And then we're gonna do an invite only campaign and also release it to the public. So this brings me to why I am here from Seoul. Uh, we're looking to incorporate in the US and we feel that the Midwest has the best opportunities for us. And so I'm looking at different cities. I'd love it if afterwards you can come and talk to me and tell me why Kansas City is the awesome city that you guys all love. Um, I'd also like it if you had any connections with content creators and MCN so I can get them on that beta list and also have conversations with them. This is the main part of our team. Um, they are all in Seoul. Uh, nobody can come out here and play with me, so. Um, but on behalf of them, as well as myself, I'd like to say thank you very much and uh, answer any questions you have. Thank you. We'd like to go ahead and start uh, with our panelists. Am I on now? All right. <laughs> Um, I did some research, or tried to do some research on your company last night, and I had um, a little bit of trouble finding your company. Um, is there a website, or was I just not able to find it? Uh, there, there is a website, it's swizzle.fm. Um, one of the problems that you're having is that uh, in Korea, um, one of the main uh, search engines is actually Naver, instead of Google. Um, and so we're now starting to kind of move into other platforms, but we're mostly popular in you know, the Southeast Asia region and all that kind of stuff, so we haven't had the motivation to really do that. Um, and also with this new pivot, because our current product is all that music video stuff, as a pivot, we're gonna be moving forward and doing more marketing to, to get that out there, so. And so you do have a website. I think um, yeah. our other panelists discovered that it just doesn't play on an iPad or an iPhone, is that correct? Um, no, for the iPhone, um, we actually have an iOS app for that. Um, and it's, we, we've been messing with the server over the last couple of days doing this new pivot. Um, and so it, it used to play on the iPad just fine. Um, but over the last few days, we've been playing around with the server. Oh, so just an inconvenient there. glitch in time for your big one. Yeah, no, no, debut. it's terrible timing. So <laughs> terrible timing. Well, I did have, because I couldn't find your website, I had the opportunity to go and read um, some of the articles that have been written about your company. Um, so some of that information is probably gonna be based on the music video concept and less this new concept. So if I understand that the previous one was music focused, where this one, I think cutting out the story for music makes it hard to you know, understand the, the music. Um, is this more for these types of compilation videos or maybe how-to videos? Uh, yeah, target? so it has a lot of different use cases, um, and that's going to be one of the, that's actually one of the reasons why we're going for content creators first, so we can kind of target a bunch of different markets to see. Um, but yeah, no, we're taking out the, the fact that it's just music, it'll be anything. Um, we've had gaming companies that come and talk to us about using it as kind of a way to go through like Twitch archive videos um, and get more users into there. We've had um, people who do how-to videos say it would be a great way to just show like the final product, and then if you're interested, you can swipe down and watch the whole thing. Um, different lifestyle videos like makeup things, um, parkour obviously was uh, kind of a jump up. We've also had uh, people talking about like cooking, where they show like the final meal and then going back. Um, but there's, there's a ton of different use cases and we're gonna have to, you know, we can predict all we want, but we're gonna have to actually explore it when we release the MVP. Well, just as a user, I probably wouldn't use it for, um, for music, but I would definitely use it for a how-to. Yeah. Uh, I think that would be great. Uh, my next question is about your business model. Um, the information I found, as I said, was may have been about the previous company. Um, what is your, uh, your business model? How do you plan on making money? Um, and it said something about that you were trying to acquire users before focusing on turning a profit. Is that still the plan? Yeah, uh, we're gonna release that MVP and go through a couple of things to see exactly what our direction is. Um, but right now, in the early stages before we have massive traction, um, it's gonna be released as a freemium model, which will help bring in a little bit of money. But the big money will come later after we have traction with a lot of B2B, with the data that we're gathering. Um, for example, one of the cool things about this is that if we have the traction that we want, it will reveal um, influencers that are kinda in between um, influencers that we know about right now. 
And these are the people that typically make things go viral. They're the ones that push your videos. And we can tell because you know, these are the people that are taking the time to actually cut your videos, and put them together, and connect you directly with them, um, as well as just trends in different areas. Um, focusing also on Southeast Asia is an area where a lot of, um, especially entertainment kind of companies are trying to get into. And we already have a foundation there, so we can help bring companies over. And what would that threshold be for the number of users that you're looking for? Um, we're probably looking at like just under a million to a million before that starts becoming a real thing. And how many do you currently have? Right now we have about 50,000 with the music video playlist system. Um, we kept it in beta, haven't done any marketing, um, so that's all word of mouth. Um, so we're excited about being able to build that up. And one last question. You've had some great traction overseas in Asia. Uh, what, what will be your difference, uh, the difference in uh, your acquisition strategy here in the States? Well, that's actually a funny thing. We're, even though we're relocating to the States, we're actually not going to focus too much on the U.S. until we've built up more traction in Southeast Asia. We are going to keep um, a team over there that's doing a lot of things. And one of the reasons for coming to the States is um, more access to capital um, and then building things up. Because the U.S. is kind of a hard market to penetrate. Um, and if you fail out here, you tend to not get that second chance. Um, and so we're going to focus over there. Um, the big way that we're going to acquire more users is working with those MCNs. Um, in Asia, we have a lot of good relationships with them. Um, and getting the content creators to make these things will drive up a need for them. We're also going to do an invite-only campaign afterwards so that their viewers who want to be able to make more will be able to sign up and we'll build a, some hype that way. Um, as far as Kansas City goes, uh, there's, nobody's going to be able to tell you as much as um, what you would experience if you just went around. I would highly recommend going to the Kansas City Startup Village, visiting some of the incubators, Sprint, Exp Sprint, Exp Sprint Accelerator, Spark Lab KC. Um, if you start moving around in those circles, you'll really start to feel the energy here, um, I think. And this is a great place to start uh, um, at One Million Cups. Um, I, I went to your website and saw your iPhone app. I really like the interaction and the app and everything. The one thing I will say is it took me a while to understand, like I went to the website and it took me a while to figure out that there was an iPhone app and, and, it, and it also took me a while to understand exactly what you do. And, but the presentation was very clear and I, I realize you're pivoting right now, but what I, what I would recommend is um, putting something on, on the website on the iPhone app that tells people about what you're going to do with video compilations, unless you're trying to keep that secret. Because that would be kind of enticing to say, okay, this is coming soon, sign up, you know, put your email in, get, you know, start to build up traction that way. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about why, why you're pivoting, what, um, with, the, with, the, pre you know, with the, the company as it is, were they feeling a lot of pain? Were they not getting the traction that they wanted? Or was this just such a cool idea that they said, we have to go in this direction? Kind of a bit, let me hit your first point. Um, I actually am spending all day today in Kansas City hitting a bunch of stuff. And I'll be finishing up at the beta, beta blocks, beta blocks thing at the evening. So I am planning on hitting a lot of people. Um, well, not hitting them, but. <laughs> the, uh, as to the other question, the reason why we did pivot is because when we did the survey, you know, it, it started off with, okay, well, these people are asking for this, well, let's just do that. And then as we were thinking about it and then having those conversations, we realized that this would be a better market to move into. Um, music video playlist is a cool idea. We had a unique feature in that other people could add videos to your playlist, but it is a very busy space. Um, and also around the same time, YouTube was announcing their uh, music subscription service. Um, and so it, we felt like there might not be as much of a future in that, and that's why we're moving on to the other thing. Um, for the website, we actually have a, uh, a front-end uh, web developer and designer who's going to be working on changing the website, and uh, we have another designer who, where our whole app, the user interface, is going to be changing dramatically, and we have people working on that, and that's one of the things that we're going to do is um, both do tutorials in the app, like when you first go in, that we'll go through and see what's happening. We're changing that up to showcase it, and also in our websites and our Facebook and everything like that, we're going to be pushing the new product, but that's going to come in April. We want to work out one more bug before we start getting people. Um, having been in the States and, and, and you know, being an entre entrepreneur in the States and going over to Seoul, is there any thing that sticks out in your mind, big differences, big uh, comparisons you could make? There's, there's a lot of big differences. <laughs> um, Korea, is, Korea is an awesome place to be. Um, it's 
Soul especially is really exciting because it, I mean, three decades ago, Seoul was, a, a, the whole, all of Korea was a third world country. And now Seoul itself, just the city, is like the 13th largest economy in the world. Um, you have such high technology there, it's really neat. Um, but the problem that they're having right now is that they're kind of torn between growing so fast and also being in an old system where you support bigger companies. But then they're dumping a lot of money into startups. It's actually why we have such a large team. We actually have eight people. Um, but they give us a lot of money that we use for salaries and, and things like that. So it's kind of an interesting um, um, place. Also, uh, as far as investments goes, a lot of them are, uh, a lot of investors are very, very, very risk adverse. Um, they, they don't like the idea of a company who's not monetizing right away. Um, it's, it's much more difficult to raise money. Um, we have had a lot of success because we have connections with a lot of different angels and cool idea helps too, but yeah. We wanna go ahead and open it up uh, to the audience as well. I see a couple of questions. We'll start here in the middle. Hi, Nick, thank you so much for your presentation. My question I have for you is what is Swizzle's plan going to be with social media? Because I have a feeling that you guys might need a might need have some great strategies for social media. Have you guys thought about that in advance? We have. Um, we actually hired a intern uh, about two months ago now. It's, it's been a long couple of months. So um, we hired an intern to uh, jump onto our Facebook and uh, the, the purpose was, and this was when we were still kind of music video, but we knew we were gonna get in this direction. And they just put a bunch of like entertaining videos on there. Um, with no real focus, trying to get like a broad range and see what would happen. Um, and also just kind of getting people used to coming to our Facebook regularly. And actually jumped up our Facebook views by, uh, dramatically. I think we have, uh, we have a ton of Facebook likes and stuff like that. And people were engaging. Um, and we're gonna capitalize on that once we have uh, this product out where we can do the video cocktails. We're gonna start throwing those on social media, tweeting to them so that people can go directly into it. Because one of the first things we're gonna do is make it so you can embed this stuff so anybody can watch. You don't have to have the app. You'll be able to do it from like your mobile app or just from the website or embed it in different blogs and stuff like that. And then just start promoting those where we're doing from cool video to, hey, here's a collection of cool videos in a better C format and moving forward with that. Question, back left. Good morning. Good morning. What I see you developed here, it's more than an app, it's more than video cocktails. There's almost this concept of videos as hyperlinks, where instead of, you know, currently the web is in a lot of ways driven by hyperlinks. We post links to pages, links to comments, links to sites. It's all about these text-based links. It feels like you're now developing a video clip as a hyperlink to another video clip, which can link to another video clip and you can build, it's almost this concept of building this whole web of linkages between videos instead of just linkages between text-based pages or a text-based page that links to a static video. Talk about the strategy around that and what I see is potential to really impact the way across the internet video is cons delivered, consumed, managed, distributed, from that really high level strategic, almost architectural point of view. Okay, um, so you actually hit on something that we've been talking about a lot. Um, we're starting with creating this um, in, so that you can kind of put together just like one cocktail that will just go from one, one and be like one package. Um, and we're gonna kick that out and see kind of where people take it so that we know what niche to follow. But eventually we are gonna do that where say you really liked a video, you kind of move in, you watch the entire video, and then you can see like other cocktails that are made up of that, and then it, we want to make it so that you can kind of fall down the rabbit hole of videos, which is something that isn't really available right now. YouTube is the best platform for it, but I mean, let's be honest, like discovering videos on YouTube is still really, really difficult. Um, and other places in the world, with those hyperlinks, you can, like I said, fall down the rabbit hole of the internet. You can just lose entire days to you know, you start with one search and who knows where you end up. So we want that to happen with videos. So yeah, you know, you're, you're spot on with what we're trying to do. Question, you're right. God, there's so many people. <laughs> How do you plan to monetize this? Because it doesn't appear to be obvious. And uh, do you have an exit plan? Well, the best way to monetize it would be to get out. 
uh, exit and sell it off, obviously. Um, but like I uh, talked to her about, we, the, in the early stages before we have a lot of traction, um, what we're gonna do is release it as a premium or a freemium model where with certain cases you, you know, can have it for free, but if you wanna build X number of cocktails, if you want fancy like transitions and all that kind of stuff, then you have to subscribe to it. Um, but ultimately, when we build traction after we have a certain number of users, um, that's when we can start really monetizing in more of a B2B sense where we are working with the data that we're accruing um, and working on selling that as well as helping companies penetrate different markets that they want to get into. So it's kind of a, monetizing it on just this, it, we felt isn't actually the smartest way to go because it would kind of kill the traction. Does that make sense? It, it, it absolutely makes sense. That's a very um, challenging way to monetize on the back end. Yeah. But we think it's the best way to go. So sometimes going for the hard thing is uh, the way to get the most reward. Another uh, question for you. You mentioned that um, you're here in the US because there's better access to capital. So the question for you is, if you're looking to actually raise more capital, um, how much would you raise? And if you did, where would you reinvest that capital? Sure. Um, we are currently angel funded to basically uh, uh, about five, six months after our MVP launch. Um, so we're good for the majority of this year. Um, we're going to raise between 700 and a mil. Um, and the, the purpose of that is basically just to get us through. Um, we think we can extend that to, you know, we're planning for a year, so maybe nine months is what it'll do. Um, but that's gonna focus on, obviously, you know, taking care of our burn rate and all, all that regular stuff, but also uh, having a certain percentage for different marketing ventures as well as traveling. Um, there's a lot of events that happen in Asia that we're constantly going to, so a lot of it is those plane tickets and everything like that. But most of it is, is manpower, manpower marketing and traveling. Question in the back. Could you speak more about the process of targeting MCNs and content creators and what you'd like to see out of that? Sure. Um, so we, with the music video, playlist system that we have, we developed a lot of uh, connections with content creators. And when I say content creators, I mean anybody who's making content online. Um, typically the ones that we're targeting, obviously because we're video based, is video based content creators. Um, we got a lot of musicians and through that um, we got a lot of you know, other people, a lot of action stars, a lot of lifestyle stars and, the, and that kind of stuff, um, mostly in the Asian market. So we're talking to those people individually, um, but the big strategy is going after MCNs. Um, through those uh, content creators, we have connections with uh, multi-channel networks in Asia, um, and we've been having conversations with them. Um, and what we've been saying is, when we sit down, we tell them you know, what we're making, um, and we tell them what they could use this product for, and that we would give it to content creators first, kind of the first few months is having that just a market that they would have, um, where they could use it to promote their previous videos, because that's an issue that a lot of content creators are having right now. Their new videos are getting a lot of traction, but their old stuff that they did last year, they're not doing it. And it's actually why a lot of them are creating compilation videos of their old stuff, but with the current system, like I said, it doesn't really pop them back. So using that as a system to get them, um, giving it to them for free uh, at first while we're building that traction, um, and also making sure that we're only doing um, non-competitive MCNs, so one MCN per region, per category, what they're doing in. Um, at first so that we can make sure that we grow this and, and you know, not get people all ticked at us at first. I've got a question here to your right. Um, so I love the idea um, and I'm, as a user, ready to jump on board. Um, because you guys are based out of Korea, everything I see right now is K-pop and, and kind of that type of music. So how are you going to segment all of your music videos and know that I want to listen to Snoop Dogg and not Psy. Um, one of the things that we're kicking out in April is um, we're, we're not separating the servers, but it'll basically feel like that, um, whereby your language and your region, um, you'll have more videos that are more specific to that area and people that are um, interacting with it. Um, but the reason why we're not actually separating the servers is because we've talked to a lot of people and a, that, people are kind of split. Some people just want their stuff, they just want it in English, but a lot of people like our stuff because they like the K-pop and they like seeing what people in Taiwan are doing. Um, so we're gonna have a global um, setting as well so you can just get everything from everywhere. Um, we're also working on a uh, categorizing feature um, that'll allow you to kind of narrow down specifically on your needs since we're obviously opening up to more than just music. Um, that'll become really important and that's happening again before our MVP. Question back right. 
Just curious, how are the uh, intellectual property rights addressed? Uh, if people are doing clips of videos that somebody created that's original, how does that play out with the cocktails? With each clip, it is still playing from like that YouTube video. So even though it feels like it's in something new, it, it is still playing from the YouTube servers, from the YouTube platforms. Um, we have spoken to lawyers about it, and they assured us that because we're doing it in that way, um, our copyright problems aren't, aren't going to be that big of a deal. Um, right now, you ha do have fair use uh, uh, rules that are being applied in YouTube, which is why you can have compilation videos, um, but they're kind of a hot topic right now. And uh, we believe that with this kind of system, it, would, it is a better way to do that because you are still sourcing um, those original videos because you can directly go to them and see where they're coming from. Question to center. Hey. Hey, Nick. So I'm going to pivot. Today, <laughs> so I'm going to uh, pivot the conversation just a little bit. Uh, so we're very excited that we got Google Fiber first. So we have very fast internet in this town. However, you you hail from a country who can uh, brag that you have even faster internet. So I'm curious uh, to know what startups or how startups are using that really fast speed. Some lessons that we might share and potentially how you might utilize such speeds for your service. Sure, well in Korea, one interesting thing that is coming up is that I mean, they have the internet of tomorrow, and so they're actually discovering the problems of tomorrow. Um, over here we don't have as many people who are looking at videos and interacting with really high bandwidth products online um, on their phones because we have you know, data limits and it just takes too long. Um, over there, when you click play on YouTube video, it just plays. That little loading circle thing, we don't even know what that is. So um, they're dealing with those kind of issues and they're coming up with uh, solutions to that that wouldn't necessarily transfer over to the US yet because we don't have the infrastructure over here. That's kind of an interesting thing that's happening. Um, we are, w with the system where it's going from clip to clip, um, it's actually an issue that we we have to kind of step back and go to places that have worse internet because we want to work on predictive preloading so that it's not as long of a process. Um, so that's kind of an interesting challenge going from one internet connected city to a less internet connected city. Um, and it would be something that we would have to make sure that we're addressing when we come here because you guys do have better internet. Um, so I think, I think that answers your question, okay. One more uh, quick question from the sure. audience back here. Yes, hi. Um, I think that your idea is, you know, it borders on brilliant and, and it's reminiscent of the uh, Because I'm Happy website. I don't know if you visited that and just see so you can watch a video 24-7 at the exact time, exam, at the exact place, but it's the exact same video. And so I think that this is video experience of the future. My question um, has to do with, are you focusing solely on, so, so in Seoul, solely on um, <laughs> <laughs> so are you focusing solely on YouTube as the main provider of the videos, or do you plan on uh, containing your own video, like as you have content creators to put videos within Swizzle, um, and Swizzle owns the videos, or is it something that um, can go across all the many different uh, video providers from the internet? There are so many. I mean, Facebook is, is one that is rivaling YouTube right now, and so I just want to know, you know, speak about how you're going to do that, like how are you using video and is it only through YouTube or what is your future projections on it? Sure. So we're starting with YouTube because they have the easiest API to work with. Um, it, they, they already have a lot of the features that we're looking to do um, and they're just, it, it's quicker to pop them out. But eventually the idea is to expand it to Vimeo and Daily Motion and, and all the others, as well as also creating another company because it's a little bit riskier and exploring the Chinese um, video services that are there. Uh, we just want that separate company in case something happens. It's, it's a funky market, so. Um, but yeah, no, we are planning on expanding on, uh, to incorporate other things. Our, our main vision is to have it so that when you can put together a clip and it can go from a YouTube clip to a Vimeo clip to a Daily Motion clip to whatever you want. Um, as far as hosting it on our own, we talked about it and uh, we don't think that it's really necessary. Um, uh, these other companies do such a great job of hosting video and having it in multiple places and putting it on our server, it would just be a waste of server space, honestly, and, and it would cost more money than is even necessary, so. So one final question, what can we as a community do to help you? Talk to me. Come out and have a conversation with me. I, 
all of this was created because we had conversations. I love talking to people. If you have cool ideas that you think people would use it or you just are excited about the way that this could go in one direction or another, I'd love to hear it. Um, I try to keep myself out of my own little box and talking to other people kind of helps me do that. As well as, like I said earlier, talk to me about Kansas City. Um, I do want to hear your thoughts about this city. Uh, the, my whole goal today is just to go around and explore the city and, and, and see what it has to offer. So. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, thank you. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today. Hopefully we will see you tonight at the Beta Blocks Demo Day. Um, come say hi. Also, I want to thank Teresa and Nick for their presentations today. They will be over here um, to the right of me if you guys have any suggestions, advice, or you know, if we want to try to convince Nick to move to Kansas City. So thank you and see you next week. <laughs>